I'm just always intrigued that someone like Virginia Fox is allowed anywhere near education, uh, never mind today's debate, talking about Columbia and various other freedom of speech and hate speeches. I mean, she's just, I don't know, reminds me of somebody you're likely to bump into in a dark alley on Halloween and run the other way. Dark path if we cannot agree on basic shared moral values, such as the implication of calls for genocide. Bright lines must be drawn before the reputational damage to American universities is endemic and intractable. With today's hearing, I hope to draw those bright lines. This is an opportunity for each of you to address the public directly and explain your stance on one of the great moral issues of our time. Anti-Semitism must have no safe harbor in American universities. With that, I yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Dr. Fox, and th thank our witnesses today for appearing with us. I'd like to start my opening statement with a video from the 2017 uh, rally to remind everyone of what, is hap what happened at the University of Virginia campus during a Unite the Right rally. Uh, as a warning, this video may contain some graphic content. Thank you. As shown in the video, white supremacists marched through the grounds of the University of Virginia in 2017, chanting slogans such as, Jews will not replace us. At the time, I wrote a letter to my Republican colleagues asking for a hearing to discuss rising tensions and discrimination on college campuses. I have that letter with me today, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter that, record, that letter into the record. Without objection. Regrettably, the country was denied the opportunity to address this issue seven years ago. What we saw in the video is not an isolated event. It is the byproduct of this country's centrally long history of white supremacy, white supremacy and anti-Semitism. And so we should not faint surprise at hate speech on America's college campuses. The fact is that college campuses are polarized and our society, and we have witnessed a disturbing rise in incidents, not, not only in anti-Semitism, but also in racism, Islam, Islamophobia, homophobia, and other forms of hate. Nonetheless, schools have a responsibility to fo foster campus environments that promote understanding, respectful dialogue, and above else, sa student safety for all students. Jewish students, in fact, all students, have a right to attend college free from hostility and in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There is uh, no excuse for anti-Semitism on campus, and everyone is entitled to that safe harbor that my colleague, the chair, referred to. As Dr. Shafik notes in her testimony, quote, while there may be some easy cases drawing a line between permissible and impermissible campus speech is enormously difficult. The U.S. Supreme Court has struggled for more than two centuries 
to define the limits of free speech under the First Amendment, and that struggle continues. Don't expect universities to figure it out overnight. Now, this moment requires thoughtful and nuanced discussion, something this committee has not always done. Moreover, we should expand the scope of our conversation to include the students who are actually being denied access to an education as a result of discrimination. We should not put on political theater or seize this strategy and its aftermath as an opportunity just to grandstand. Rather, we need to recenter this conversation around our obligation to provide all students with a safe learning environment. In particular, as members of Congress, we must examine the issues of anti-Semitism and all other forms of animus on campus. This includes respecting the need for safe environment to learn and the importance of the First Amendment. And finally, while I appreciate my colleagues' newfound concerns for some students' civil rights on campus, I would note that it is at odds with House Republicans' budget proposals. You can't have it both ways. You can't call for action and then reduce funding for the very agency charged with protecting students' civil rights. In conclusion, I hope this discussion today is more thoughtful and deliberate and respectful of the complex constitutional question before us, even though the same opportunity was not afforded to Democrats when we requested it after the racist UVA rally seven years ago. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I appreciate the ranking member's deeply held concern about racial and other forms of discrimination. I share his abhorrence of such discrimination and white supremacist beliefs in particular. As I said in 2017, quote, the violence and bigotry displayed in Charlottesville remain an affront to our shared American values. I strongly condemn these acts of hate, end quote. It's unfortunate that referencing the tragedy in Charlottesville has become a repeated talking point at committee events intended to address the wave of anti-Semitism occurring nationwide today. The episode to which Congressman Scott refers was not organized or attended by university students, but was instead held by a group of white supremacists who trespassed at the university. There was no cause or jurisdiction for the committee to open a broad investigation or one into the University of Virginia for an event its students didn't attend, that the university did not approve, and that was appropriately responded to by the university. There was also no pattern of such events on campuses across the nation to address. In contrast, at Columbia and numerous other schools, there has been a pattern of unapproved anti-Semitic events organized and attended by university students and staff that have denied Jewish students their right to a safe learning environment and a failure by university administrators to respond appropriately to that denial. For being here today. Uh, many of us here uh, never would have imagined right. okay. that we would be concerned about the safety of Jewish Americans in, in New York, of, of all places. Uh, Jewish Americans have faced some of the highest levels of anti-Semitic anti incidents since the FBI began monitoring. Anti-Semitic incidents at, at U U.S. college campuses have increased in both number and intensity since October 7th. And as a former professor myself of 40 years, I'll tell you on a campus that is unacceptable. 73% um, of Jewish college students have experienced or witnessed uh, some form of anti-Semitism since the beginning of the school year, and only one-third of Jewish students felt safe on campuses. I think every student should feel safe on any campus uh, that they're studying on. But um, Mr. Scheiser, let me ask you, you are co-chair of the Task Force on Anti-Semitism on your campus. Uh, how has the task force 
recognize the unique challenges that Columbia faces in dealing with protests and demonstrations, harassment allegations, and overall threats to segments of the student population while being an urban and open campus in one of the largest cities in the world. It's a critical responsibility, Congresswoman, for exactly the reasons that you described. This is not an acceptable situation. I do want to say there are wonderful things happening at Columbia, too, and part of what moves me is how many people have pitched in to make sure that we deal with this problem. But the problem is there, and it is not yet fixed. And I will say that our first step was to look at rules for protests, and I am very grateful that our responses have been taken so seriously. And as I said, the university is implementing all of our recommendations, but we're only just getting started. We have another report coming out next month. We've got to look at student orientations. We've got to look at the way we train people who deal with students. We've got to look at the policies for student groups to make sure that people don't get excluded. And then we have more reports that we have in mind for next year, including careful research to get detailed insights into the people who've been victims of this discrimination, because we need to understand it and we need to stop it. Thank you, sir. So you're expecting uh, recommendations uh, from this? Okay. So uh, Columbia is over 270 years old. That's almost uh, three decades, or, or three centuries, actually. Uh, and it, it wasn't until 1873 that Columbia became an integrated institution by allowing its first black student uh, by the name of James R. Priest to enroll, who was also the son of a former slave. Over history, your missions and role have evolved as an institution of higher education. And my question uh, to, uh, to you is, uh, how do the trustees work to ensure that Columbia remains true to its practice of progress while making sure that it is welcoming and responsive to demographic groups that it was not originally designed to serve? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So. One of the great privileges of being at a university is a diverse student body. People who come from very different backgrounds who then meet each other, learn from each other, learn with each other, and we need to be sure that that continues to happen uh, in all the ways that universities do well. And one of the challenges of the recent months is that I think we've fallen short in various ways, but the aspiration is there, and our commitment to be welcoming and also open has to apply to everyone. Thank you. So, Ms. Uh, Ms. Shipman or Mr. Greenwald, would you like to respond?